Well, I'm old school. Not old. <laughs> Age is relative. But I'm old school. By that I mean I still like to pay my bills with a check. Oh, oh how many of you are like me? My people. At the noon. I thought I was becoming a dinosaur. There are other dinosaurs here. Anyway, uh, and I, but here's, I bet you this isn't true of you. I like to actually go to the post office and mail them. Oh, I love the noon. I still like to go inside a bank and actually talk to the teller. And, oh, this one's going on the tape. Anyway, uh, and I actually still take the newspaper. I bet none of, none of you do. Yeah. I have it delivered to my house, actually two, the Wall Street Journal and the, and the Oregonian. As a kid, I used to uh, deliver papers. I was a paper boy. 365 days a year, I rode a bike, had about 60 people on my paper route. I had to collect money from them every month. But I had to deliver the papers by 6.30 in the morning. I had this one guy, if his paper was not on his porch by 6.30, he called my house. Where's my paper? He was kind of grumpy. Anyway, he needed Jesus. But um, I... <laughs> I threw my papers right smack on the porch so that you came out in your bathroom and you opened your door and there was your paper. My dad made me do it that way. Anyway, nowadays, they deliver them in a car and they just drop them out the window. You're lucky if you get it on the sidewalk, <laughs> let alone anywhere near your porch. But I have a dog. His name is Jackson. And he goes out every morning braving the freezing rain, sleet, and snow. And I've trained him. He brings my papers in the house, one at a time, drops them at my feet. <laughs> Take that, you cat people. Let's see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, a while back, anyway, a while back, my paper didn't show up. I made a call. They brought one out. This is the number you call. Uh, a couple days later, didn't show up again. I called. This happened three times. Finally... This really sharp guy shows up, and he comes, and they knock on your door. He goes, hi, I'm Dave. I'm the manager of this area, and I just came to apologize. Um, you know, uh, I'm having trouble with my delivery people. And he was an older guy. He was sharp, and he said this to me. He goes, it's hard to find good people. You know, you don't need a master's degree to deliver newspapers to somebody's house. You just need to have a car. It used to be a bike. Now it's to have a car, get up early. <laughs> and pay attention to detail. And yet this sharp guy <clears throat> had to leave his manager's office, drive to my house himself because his employee had dropped the ball, or rather neglected to drop the paper where he was supposed to. Now we've been talking about work these past few weeks, the theology of it, the blessing of it, the reasons for it. And Jamark has been uh, hammering home a lot about vocation. Remember, vocation is work that fits you, helps others, and glorifies God. We've been saying that work uh, that glorifies God <clears throat> is when you work in a way that God intended, when you work like the scriptures teach we are to work. And that's what I want to talk to you about uh, this afternoon. To that end, we're going to take a quick journey through the book of Proverbs, and we're going to jump into the New Testament and look at five ways you can glorify God in your work. They're not all the ways, but they're, they're just some, but they're five. We're gonna, I'm going to give you a heads up. We're going to spend most of our time <clears throat> on the first three. So don't freak out if you're dying for lunch, and I haven't gotten to point four there. When we get to four and five, it will go quick. Now, if you're taking notes this afternoon, please do take notes. That's why we give you a note sheet. Write them down. And as, as we walk through these five things from the scriptures, ask yourself, are these things true of me? Now, these five principles apply to all of us here today, whether you're an employer or an employee. I love Jesus Church because it's made up of such diverse people. And yet every one of us is important to him. Everyone is loved by him. Everybody has a calling from him. We've all been given work to do. Some of you are students and you're working part-time at Starbucks or wherever. Others of you are in construction. You're builders or architects or masons. Uh, we have in our church doctors and dentists. They're entrepreneurs. They're presidents. They're VPs. They're our Nike executives, Intel engineers, teachers. There are moms which is a huge job and a huge, yeah, and they are here. You are my wife's people. <laughs> you are my people too. Anyway, um, and what I want to share with you today, these things apply to every single one of us. So heads up, here we go. Turn to Proverbs chapter 10. We're going to start there, Proverbs 10. The book of Proverbs is an ancient Hebrew wisdom book filled with wisdom, <laughs> filled with instruction, kind of short sayings, 
on how to live right, how to live life skillfully. And the majority of the book was written by King Solomon at the height of Israel's story. So Solomon had thousands of people working for him, building the temple, building the palace, doing public work projects, which is why a good portion of his Proverbs are on work. So let's look at a few today. First of all, we're going to start uh, Proverbs 10, verse 4, where Solomon writes, Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. Another translation of that word uh, verse says, poor is he who works with a negligent hand. We're talking about work here. But the hand of the diligent makes rich. If you want to glorify God in your work as you follow Jesus, number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. Be diligent. Be diligent in the way you work. A good worker possesses this quality, diligence. The the word in Hebrew, uh, it has the idea of being industrious. It actually, means to, it actually means sharp, to cut with a sharp, but the idea is you're industrious, you're cutting through, you're working hard. In Scripture, diligence is considered a precious and valuable commodity. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 27 says, the precious possession of a man is diligence. It's a precious thing. This diligence or industriousness is one of the qualities of the Proverbs 31 woman. Um, Let me read you a portion. We'll put it up on the screen. Proverbs 31, it says, She works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. I love that word. Her arms are strong for her tasks. The diligent worker is a hard worker, not not a lazy worker. Now, like most of you, I've worked with both kinds of people. I've worked with diligent workers, industrious workers. I both admired them and couldn't keep up with them. And I know some of you in this church, and you're like that. I see Eric over here, Eric Freeman. He's one. He, and Luis Palau was a guy I worked for. I, none of us could keep up with him. He's you know, older than me, but it's like, you know, he's all about, I'm going to reach the world for Jesus. Ah, you know, I was like, man, I'm tired. Let's go. You know, he was very industrious and still is. And I've also worked with people who are basically lazy. Instead of working hard, they were hardly working. Guess which ones get promoted? Guess which ones receive raises? Guess which ones move up to higher positions of responsibility? You got it, the diligent ones. Proverbs 12, 24 says, the hand of the diligent will rule, but the slack hand will be put to forced labor. Basically, the Bible says, don't be a slacker. (laughs) Another translation of that is, work hard and become a leader, be lazy and become a slave. If you show me anybody who's leading anything, you're going to find a diligent worker, a hard worker. Proverbs 14, 23 says, all hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. If you sit around saying, one of these days I'm going to start a business, or one of these days I'm going to, I got this dream, and you just talk, 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 but you never do anything, you're going to end up poor. (laughs) Nothing will ever happen, but if you get to work, roll up your sleeves, that work's going to bring a profit. Turn to the left just a few pages to Proverbs chapter 6. The lazy person in Proverbs is called A sluggard. (laughs) Interesting word. Doesn't sound good. Not a slug, a sluggard. Proverbs 6, verse 9. Solomon writes, How long will you lie there, you sluggard? (laughs) I love the Bible. (laughs) That was you and me when we didn't want to get up this morning. (laughs) How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief, and scarcity like an armed man. Laziness will lead to poverty every time. This word sluggard here in Proverbs, it's closest to our word lazy, which is why the New Living Bible translates this verse. I love it. But you, lazy bones, how long will you sleep? When will you wake up? This word sluggard appears 13 times in the book of Proverbs. Solomon must have had a few people working for him who were lazy, at least 13, because he uses this word 13 times. Being lazy is the opposite of being industrious. The, the slugger, the lazy person, takes no initiative, wastes time, is unproductive, and reaps the consequences of his laziness. And worse yet, laziness is a downward spiral that actually eventually gets you into trouble. It actually leads to moral failure. 
If you're just hanging out, you're not working very hard, you've got too much free time, you end up doing stuff you shouldn't be doing, looking at stuff you shouldn't be looking at, eating stuff you shouldn't be eating, whatever. And on the other hand, if you're industrious and you're working hard, you're going to sleep well. God wants you to work hard and rest well, <laughs> and he wants you to stay out of trouble, which, by the way, Proverbs 21, 25 says, the craving of the sluggard will be the death of him. It's going to get you in trouble because his hands refuse to work. God wants you to work hard and rest well. I've noticed on vacation when I'm just chilling out, sometimes I don't sleep that good at night, but if I've worked really hard, especially when I used to work construction, man, I'd hit the pillow at night, man, I'm out. It actually says in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 12, the sleep of the working man is pleasant. When you work hard, you rest well. Now, by the way, this series, John Mark asked before we started, he asked all the pastors for suggestions for titles to this series. John Mark's super creative, and, and uh, nobody had any good ones, hence the work series. <laughs> really creative. I had a suggestion. Mine got rejected. Mine was grow up and get a job. <laughs> it got rejected. I'm still bitter. But anyway... There are a lot of reasons to work hard, to grow up and get a job. Let me just give you two this morning. One is so you don't become a burden to others. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians this in chapter 3. He said, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling. Now look what he says here. So that we would not be a burden to any of you. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who was unwilling to work shall not eat. In other words... <laughs> If you're not going to roll up your sleeves and help around here, we're not going to feed you. Paul said, hey, that's not us. We worked hard so we wouldn't be a burden to you. If you're hardly working, somebody else is having to carry your weight. A second reason to work hard is found in Ephesians, where Paul wrote to the Ephesians. He said, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands. Here's why. That they may have something to share with those in need. That's the second reason to work, so you can have something to share with people in need, both so you can give to God and share with others. When you work, you make an income, you can come here and you've got offerings to give to God, to put in the bowls to support orphans and widows and the gospel being preached. And then if somebody, you come across somebody that's hurting, hey, you've got some money in your pocket because you worked and you can reach out and help them. Are you a burden to anyone because you're not working? Um, are you a burden to your parents or your wife or your husband? Are you sharing the fruits of your labor with God and with other people? Or is it like, hey, it's all mine, it's all mine? Now, by the way, you may, if you're here today and you're unemployed, there's a lot of people unemployed. This, this message uh, is not a guilt trip on you. There are a lot of you who are, really want to work and you, you can't find work right now. But as you listen to this message, here's what I like to say to people who are unemployed. When you don't have a job, your job is getting a job. Sometimes people, look, I, you get depressed, especially guys, but you tend to just like chill out. Hey, I'll just go, you know, go to the gym and then just lay by the pool and wish I had a job. Maybe the phone will ring someday. No, your job is getting a job. You need to be diligent and you need to get out there and start knocking on doors and getting help and getting counsel. And, you know, nine to five, I would be working. So nine to five, I'm looking for a job. And so these things apply to you today, even if you're not um, uh, employed right now. If you want to glorify God in your work, don't be lazy, don't be a slacker, don't be a sluggard. <laughs> be diligent, just work hard. By the way, don't ask your boss to be promoted. Just work hard and you'll likely get promoted. That's the way it works. Turn to the right in your Bible to uh, Proverbs 22. And we'll move on to the second thing I want us to see from the scriptures. If you want to glorify God in your work, develop a skill. Secondly, here in Proverbs 22, 29, we see the second thing. Solomon writes, do you see someone skilled in their work? The question he asks. They will serve before kings. They will not serve before officials of low rank. If you want to be an effective worker, number two, if you're taking notes, develop a skill. Be diligent, develop a skill. This verse, uh, verse 29 here in the New Living says, do you see any truly competent workers? They will serve kings. If you look around, you say, how come that, how did he get that job? How come she got promoted instead of me? Chances are, it's because they were diligent and they're competent. Their boss saw that they showed up and they were diligent about their job and they were good at it. They, be, they became skilled at their job. 
Now, John Mark touched on excellence uh, a few weeks ago, but let's go a little further today and talk about how you become good at something. Remember, the correct Benjamin Franklin quote is, Jack of all trades and master of what? Of one. We misquote it, master of none. It's master of one. That's what he was saying. Hey, be good at some stuff, but be really good at one thing. How do you become skilled at something? And in order to answer that, turn over two more chapters to Proverbs 24. The book of Proverbs, by the way, is amazing. I hope you're reading it. I'm kind of a Proverbs freak, but anyway, junkie. I read it. I've been reading it for years. There's 31 chapters. You just read the chapter of the day. Today's the fourth. I read Proverbs 4 this morning. Yesterday was Proverbs 3. I read it and got something for myself every time. Proverbs 24 says to become skilled at something is going to take preparation. Look at verse 27. Prepare your work outside, Solomon writes. Make it ready for yourself in the field. Afterwards, then, build your house. Now, this is a farming analogy here, if, if, and I'm not a farmer, but if, if you go buy 40 acres and you want to become a farmer, the first thing you do is not build your house. The first thing you do is plow your fields, drop in the seed, grow the crops, sell the crops, and with your money, then you go build your house. Preparation is how you begin to be effective as a worker and become skilled at something. Before you get married, before you buy a house, you need to get some income. And there are girls here that are hoping to find a guy that thinks that way. <laughs> yes, I'd love to have a guy who actually works. Okay, and, and then marries me and, and helps me, you know, loves me and raises the family with me. You, you, need to, you need to get it in the right order. Now, God uses the world of nature to show us how this works. By the way, every time you walk around, just open your eyes. God, is, God speaks through the scriptures, but he speaks through creation all the time. And in Proverbs, he speaks about preparation through a tiny little insect called the ant. Now, you don't have to turn there, but if you're taking notes, write down Proverbs 6, 6 through 8, where Solomon writes this, and God's speaking through him. Go to the ant, O oh, sluggard. I love, I love the Bible. Go to the ant, O oh, sluggard. Observe her ways and be wise which having no chief, officer, or ruler, prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provision in the harvest. Another translation says of the ant, though they have no prince or ruler to make them work, in other words, no boss, they labor hard all summer, gathering food for the winter. So Solomon says, and the Lord says, next time you see an ant, don't step on it. <laughs> Look down and say, hello, little ant. I'm supposed to observe your ways and be wise. Have you ever looked, like, I know they're irritating if they're in the wrong place, but have you ever seen an ant carrying like three times its weight? How many of you have seen that? It's amazing. God made that little guy. And God says, hey, check him out. He's super industrious. And he's skilled at what he does. Not just the ant. Proverbs 30, 26 says, the rock badger makes its house in the rocks. If you haven't noticed it, next time you drive into church here, I come in there all the time, but right before you get to building S on the right, have you seen that thing that looks like a beaver dam there? Do you know? Yeah. If you haven't noticed, look at it on your way out. There's, it's not a beaver because they're trying to kill all the beavers in Oregon, but anyway, it's this little thing called a nutria. It looks like a beaver, only it's actually a rat. It's a beaver with a tail. And they're around here in the ponds and stuff. A little nutria spotted that greenway. Hey, there's food here. There's water here. Uh, I'm going to build a house here, but look at it. It looks like a mount, but then it's got a roof on it. There's all these long things. It's got a roof. It's like a little Quonset hut. <laughs> now, if an ant can do it, if a nutria can do it, what's wrong with you and me? The ant prepares, the nutria prepares, and we're like, I don't know what to do with my life. I don't know where I'm headed. <laughs> it's like, God says, look to the ant, you sluggard. Okay, let's keep going. <laughs> Proverbs 16, 9. If you forget nothing else, write this down. The mind of man plans his way. This idea of planning is all through Proverbs. Plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. A lot of you just quote the second half. Hey, the Lord's going to direct my steps. It's all, God's going to take care of me. It's just all going to work out. And we neglect to see the first half of the verse. The mind of man plans his way, and the Lord directs his steps. In other words, you prepare. You prepare, and you start moving in a direction. And yes, the Lord will direct your steps. You know, you start in this direction and say, no, no, I'm going to close that door because actually this is where I want you to go. And he can steer you when you're moving. The word plans here in Proverbs 16, 9, 
Uh, hasab is a verb that means to think or devise. It was used of plotting out a course. To become skilled at something, you need to plot out a course. It's going to take preparation, and your preparation is going to yield a reward because Proverbs 21.5 says the plans of the diligent lead surely to profit. There's going to be a reward for your labor. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but how many of you are here this afternoon you're saying, you know, I really want to get married or I really want to start in this career. I really want to, you know, do you have a plan to get there? The Bible says you should. Now, many jobs, most jobs today that will support a family, preparation is going to include education or a serious apprenticeship at something that yields a good income. See, thousands of years ago, this was simple. You just did what your parents did. You went on into the family business, hence all the English surnames, last names, like the last name Baker. If you were a baker, you were a baker. If you were a, a smith, you were a blacksmith. And if, you were a, if your name, last name was Carpenter, you came from a family who was a carpenter or butcher, whatever. And Comer, we combed hair for a living. Anyway, I don't know. <laughs> Actually, no, there's no B in my name. I, somebody said it means from the valley or something. Oh, in Spanish, it means to eat, maybe, whatever. Anyway, for... But preparation is going to include education. And I, I feel bad having to say this. There's a lot of young people in our church, but I need to say it. The day is past for you to be able to just graduate from high school and just kind of start doing whatever, and you're going to make enough money to marry and support your wife and three kids. Used to be okay. When I, when I was a kid, you could do that. My, my dad had a college degree. He managed a factory. He was an accountant. The guy next door drove a long-haul truck. They bought the same house. They both had a nice car. They both had three kids, etc. Those days, those days are gone because it's become an information economy, a knowledge economy, and a global economy. And there's exceptions, but for the most part, preparation is going to need some education. And here's the deal. The greater the responsibility the longer the preparation. The greater the responsibility, the longer the preparation. We have a young guy in our church, Brian Lowell. I don't know if he's in this gathering or not, but he's engaged to, to Anna. He's, uh, he's in the process of becoming a doctor, and I got hold of him to say, Brian, how many years does it take to become a doctor? And so here's what he says. So first of all, you have to have a four-year university degree to get into medical school. So there's four years of college. He goes, then medical school is another four years. And everybody graduates from medical school with the same degree. Then you go into residency to learn your specialty. And the shortest residency is three years. The longest one's about eight years. So by my math, that's 11 to 16 years before you, quote, become a doctor. But then he said, it takes most people numerous years to get into medical school. Because these are highly driven, very intelligent people that, that choose this career. And so it took Brian six years to get into medical school. And so add all that up. Whatever, however much money doctors make, as far as I'm concerned, it's not enough. <laughs> all, all I know is when somebody works on me or cuts into me, I don't want to say, hey, where'd you go to school? Oh, I had a semester at PCC. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> don't touch me. <clears throat> I want to hear the guy went to school for 11 years. Before he works, and not every job is this way, I understand. But think of Jesus. 30 years of preparation for three years of work. Think about it. Age 30, he began his ministry. Three years later, he gave his life on the cross. That was why he came, to die for us and rise again. What are you preparing for? Are you preparing? Have you developed a skill? And I got to say a quick word to parents here. How many of you are parents of any age, kids? Parents, okay, tons of you. It's your job to help your kids figure out and discover how God's gifted them and, and what their vocation should be to guide them, what their God-given abilities and, and strengths are, and it takes time. Jesus knew by age 12 the direction he was headed in. For me, for many years, my skill was music. And you know, when I was in middle school, my middle school music teacher went to my parents and rebuked them. This kid has talent. You need to be giving him piano lessons. My parents were like, okay, okay. Mrs. Cheney said, we're going to pay for it. And then uh, I started a band between, uh, right as I got into high school, this rock band. I did it for nine years. I got saved out of it. But anyway, you know what my mom did? She let our band practice in her house, learn how to play, and then we got better and better. Not for a few weeks or a month and say, you guys are too loud. Get out of here. For years. For years, because she, she saw that and she wanted to invest in it, and then I ended up, went to school for it. But anyway, Solid Rock is full of young men and young women. A bunch of them are in this gathering. Some of you are their parents. They're trying to find their vocation work that fits them, and if you're their parent, you need to help them. 
not abandon them. Some parents abandon their kids as soon as they graduate from high school. Hey, you're 18 now, you're on your own, you know, and you know, whatever you decide, honey, I'm behind you. But they don't help them. That's where they need more help than ever. Sometimes it's those four years between college, between high school and college where they're trying different things and they're thinking, I thought this is what I was good at, but I, it's not my, John Mark is my oldest son, you know. And you guys see him now at 31 in his calling. He's a teacher, you know, he's a theologian. He's, he's in his calling, he's in his vocation. Well, that wasn't always the case. I mean, there was a time when he felt called, but there was a time when he was, I think he was about 15, he came, Mom and Dad, I figured out I can make a ton of money. I'm going to start going door to door selling knives for this company called Cutco. <coughs> and um, you know about Cutco knives? Okay, so, so he was going to make a killing. He goes, I know I can do this. So he said, but mom and dad, here's the deal. If somebody buys the whole set, I get a free set. So <laughs> would you guys be my first sale? <laughs> so, so it's our son, right? So how much is it? $680. Okay, son. You are our boy. I wrote the check. I bought the thing. He got his free one. That was the first and last set of knives he ever sold. <laughs> he knocked on about two doors, and he came back. He goes, Dad, I can't do this. I'm just not a salesman. So my job was to help him learn that. That one was painful. I, every, I, I think of him every time I pull a knife out of there. Yes, John Mark, thank you, $680. So, you know, you don't hit a home run every time. But he was figuring out what his calling was. He's got drive, he, and, and his drive now is here, you know, leading this church. And, and um, my, my job, my wife's job was part of helping him and my other kids figure that out. And parents, if you're not doing that, just call up your son or daughter today and say, hey, I'm really sorry, I should have been more involved, but hey, it's never too late. Let me, let's get together, let's grab coffee, let's, let's talk about this, and I want to help you. By the way, you know, when I was in high school and college, I never heard of life coach. There was no such thing as a life coach. Now it's a career. And if you're a life coach, it's not to put you down. But in my opinion, you know why we need life coaches? Because parents aren't fulfilling their God-given responsibility. Proverbs 22.6 says parents are to train up their children or start them out in the way that they should go. And when they're old, they won't depart from it. That's not just talking about spiritual training. That's part of it. It, it says according to their bent. Figure out how God's wired them, and it's your job to guide them. But because parents aren't doing it, we have life coaches now. There are girls and guys, I just know what to do, and my dad never talks to me. So, hey, will you be my life coach, and I'll pay you money for it. And, and, and I say, parents, it's our job. It's hard to find good people, Dave told me. But if you want to be an exception, be diligent and develop a skill. Be good at what you do. There's a third thing. Turn over to the New Testament to Luke 17, and we'll see the third thing uh, this afternoon. That is a characteristic of a, a worker who glorifies God. Did Jesus talk about work? Oh, yeah. And let's look at one thing he said here in Luke 17, verse 10. He said, So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded you, say, We are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. Luis Palau taught his four sons this verse, and, and some of those boys are really hard workers. He basically said, taught, taught him what Jesus says here is, hey, when you're working, don't just do what you have to do, do more than you have to do. In other words, if you're hired by a company and you have a job description, do your job description. That's what they're paying you to do. But Jesus says if that's all you're doing... You're an unworthy servant. You're just doing what you're getting paid to do. If you have the heart of a servant, you should be going beyond what they're paying you to do and do even more. I call this, if you're taking notes, number three, going the extra mile. Develop, uh, develop a skill is the second one. Be diligent is the first one. This one here is go the extra mile. Don't do the bare minimum. Don't just do what you have to do. Do more than you have to do. Uh, this is the heart of a servant. Do what you're asked to do and then say, is there anything else I can do for you? You know, when we were raising our kids, we wanted to teach them how to work. And so, I don't know, we figured this out one day. We, we tell them to go clean the room or whatever and then report back to us. And then we started making a game out of it. They had to come back to me or to my wife and say, reporting for duty, father. <laughs> I thought that was pretty smart. And then, then I met this couple in our church here, Scott and Brenda Wagner. They totally one up me. You know how they raised their kids? They said, whenever we ask you to do anything, you go do it. Then you come back and you say, Mom, is there anything else you'd like me to do? Ooh. 
Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> That's going to go in intentional. My wife and I are putting this thing together to teach young couples on ch- raising kids who love Jesus. But anyway, what they were really doing was teaching their kids to have the heart of a servant, to have Jesus' heart, to go the extra mile. Go do what I ask you to do and then come back and say, is there anything else I can do for you? Those kids are going to carry that into their lives as adults, and they're going to be successful. I guarantee it. Their parents taught them how to have this heart. If you work at Starbucks and your shift manager asks you to clean the sink and you go over to the clink, sit the clink, you go over to the sink and the counter's dirty because somebody cut a bagel on it, clean the counter. And your bo- maybe your boss will notice it, maybe they won't. Oh, you didn't have to clean the counter, that's okay. It was dirty, I took care of it. Or if you're walking across and somebody dropped a coffee cup, you didn't drop it, somebody else did. Pick it up. Go the extra mile. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10 says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. I love to watch anybody do anything well. Whether it's wash a windshield at the gas station or when they, the barista pours a latte and they do that little flower thing on the top. That's awesome. It's going the extra mile. What, when we lived in California, my wife and I used to love to go to this bed and breakfast in San Luis Obispo called the Apple Farm. And the first time we went there, you know, my wife is a total neat freak. Pray for her. She's married to me. But anyway, not a mess. She's like John Mark. Perfect order everywhere. Um, anyway, we go to the Apple Farm, and I'm walking in the room, and, and she immediately says, this is so clean. I don't think there's a speck of dust here. I go, who cares? But she, she's like, I wonder, what, I wonder if they vacuum under the beds. So she, she walks over to the bed and she pulls this thing up and there's a little sign in there, yes, we clean under here too. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. That's going the extra mile. Now, part of going the extra mile is that kind of thing, but here's another part of it. Keeping a good attitude. If you have the heart of a servant, you're going to have a good attitude. The Proverbs 31 woman isn't a whiner. Proverbs 31 says she works with eager hands, and she smiles at the future. You young guys, look for a girl who works with with joy and who smiles a lot. You'll do well, and I can tell you some who they are. Okay. But attitude is everything. If you want to get passed over for a promotion, in fact, if you want to get fired, have a lousy attitude. Be a grump, be a complainer, be a critic, be a mope. I'm just here to get my paycheck. You know, a, a, a couple, just before I moved up here, I, I worked for a guy, a pastor in California for two years. Within a few months, we, he was a great guy. We, we both respected each other, but it wasn't a good fit. And I was having trouble getting in sync with where he was going. I'd, I'd been at this church before him. Anyway, one day he walks into my office. I was the worship pastor there. He walks in and he goes, Phil, he goes, I love you, but I just got to tell you, because you're the weak link around here. And man, did my pride rise up. I said, you're calling me the weak link, buddy? I was here before you, and I know this church better than you. And are you saying my music? He goes, no, I'm not talking about your music. He said, I'm talking about your attitude. And he was right. He was trying to lead this church. It had been through a crisis, and he had guys with him, and I wasn't with him. I didn't agree with some of the things he was doing, and so I became the weak link on his team. And it was hard for me to hear but he was dead right. I needed to either get with the program or move on. And I did move on to a certain thing. We, we still love each other to this day. But it wasn't a good fit for the two of us. But I was the weak link. So I'm not preaching at you today. I'm preaching it myself. I've been there. I've been the person with the bad attitude. Attitude is everything. Dave Hughes, who's one of our pastors now, he's one of our elders for years, he, he managed a print shop for long. He's had all kinds of people report to him. I asked him once, when I was preaching on work, hey, Dave, what's your biggest headache as a boss? I could hardly get it out of, his, out of my mouth. He said, attitude. He goes, I can teach skills, but I can't control somebody's attitude. And a good attitude is contagious. A bad attitude spoils the whole atmosphere. So get rid of any attitude that you're owed something. None of us are owed anything. If you have the attitude of a servant of Jesus, hey, going the extra mile, that's what God would want all of us to do as we work for him. By the way, don't ever say to your boss, well, that's not on my job description, (laughs) unless you want to get fired. Um, You know why? Because if you're a Jesus follower, servants don't do that. They go, is there anything else you'd like me to do? That should be your attitude. 
By the way, if you're a pastor here, they all have job descriptions, you know, because they all have different areas. At the bottom of every pastor's job description, I learned this a long time ago, the last item says, other duties as assigned. <laughs> Which means <laughs> we can ask you to do anything, anytime. But they don't care because they are so glad to be here. <clears throat> That's all they're doing. They love you and they want to serve you today. One of them was bringing me a banana. Another one's brought me some coffee this morning. Hey, you want me some coffee? They're, they're just servants. And they, they don't care if it's in their job description. They just want to serve and do it. Today, the problem is nobody or very few people, maybe not nobody, want to do the hard stuff, want to do the hard thing. Every job, pretty much, most if not all, have parts to them that just aren't fun, that you don't necessarily enjoy doing. They just have to get done. They might be boring, unpleasant, or just plain difficult. And another one of our elders, Steve Marshman, he talked to an employer recently who said they just can't find somebody that'll do all their job. They want to do the stuff they like, but they don't want to do the stuff that's on their job description that's just not fun. And Steve told me he's talked to CEOs. They have the same problem. I just can't find somebody that'll just do, do everything with, with joy. They only want to do the stuff they like. By the way, Jesus is always our example. You know, Jesus loved people. I mean, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He, he loved hanging out. People loved hanging out with him. But he also went to the cross. In the garden, he sweat drops of blood, saying, Father, let this cup pass from me. This is going to be awful. He, he agonized. He wrestled with God. I'm called to go die for the sins of the world, but it's going to be awful. But he didn't say, hey, I'm just going to go do what I like to do. Forget this. No, he went through and he died for you and me. Nobody here has faced anything that difficult. Jesus did the work. He finished the job. Another friend of mine who worked in personnel for years you know, said, Phil, if, if you don't enjoy 70% of your job, you won't last. That's true. But I'm just talking about the other 30%. What about doing that other 30% that isn't the fun part with a godly attitude? God can give you the ability to do the mundane stuff with joy. And when you see somebody doing the mundane stuff with joy, it's awesome. I walked into Urban Outfitters at one Christmas um, over here in Bridgeport, and I'm not fond of that store. But anyway, I had to get in there to buy a present for somebody. You know, at Christmas, they have all these tables with stuff piled up. People like going, they're flying. I got to go here and I got to, and they're throwing. Everything. There was this girl with her Urban Outfitters thing on, folding all the messes that people had made. And I walked in with Diane and she goes, hi, how are you? And she's smiling. We were in that store a half hour. I couldn't get out of there that fast. Anyway, on my way out, she was still at the same table because people were still going, she's folding stuff. She goes, thank you for coming in today. I go, she's got to be a Christian. Anyway, <laughs> if not, she should be. She should get up and tell my people how to work. Anyway, um, she had a great attitude, and she was doing a menial task with a big smile on her face. All right, two more, and we'll wrap up. I told you the last two were going to move quick. Colossians chapter 3, you can turn there if you want, and we'll throw it on the screen. Paul wrote a letter to the Colossians, and he said this in verse 23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Number four, if you're taking notes, remember who you're working for. Who with a capital W. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. As a follower of Jesus, you may say, oh, I don't really like my boss. Well, you're not really working for him anyway. In one way, yes, but really you're working for Jesus. Don't ever forget it. Now, I'm an NBA basketball junkie. Ian is crazier than me. But anyway, how many of you like NBA basketball? You guys know who Jeremy Lin is? The war, the, America's going crazy for him. They're calling it Lin Sanity. This was the guy. He's from the Bay Area. One of the, the trailblazers goes to our church. He played against Jeremy in high school. But anyway, this guy was just a, you know, in the NBA, but not famous or anything. You've got to be really good to get into the NBA. But anyway, Carmelo Anthony gets injured, so he's put in the starting lineup. He just starts lighting it up. I mean, he scores like 30-something points. He's having a great game. All of a sudden, this guy, this, this normal guy, he's like, people are going crazy. They can't make enough of his jerseys, et cetera. Did you know that he's a follower of Jesus? And, and, and I read an article about him in the Wall Street Journal. It said, he says in this interview that he's learned not to obsess about stats and championships. And this is what he said, and I quote, I'm not working hard and practicing day in and day out so that I can please other people. My audience is God. The right way to play is not for others and not for myself, but for God. 
I, then he says this, I still don't fully understand what that means. This guy is so humble. You know, they were saying, what's your favorite nickname? Lynn Sanity? He goes, just call me Jeremy, because <laughs> I'm just Jeremy. Um, he says, I still don't fully understand what this means. I struggle with these things every game, every day. I'm still learning to be selfless and submit myself to God and give up my game to him. That's a guy that understands who he's playing for. And um, you say, well, he's going to be a millionaire. Well, I'm not an NBA player. I'm just a busboy at P.F. Chang's. Doesn't matter. People are watching you. You can make or break your witness for Jesus by how good or bad your work ethic is. All it takes is one major blow up or attitude problem, and you can scar your witness. How do you know that even though this is a job you don't plan on doing for, that God, for a long time, that maybe God has you right there because there's one person he wants to reach through you? And by your attitude and your example, and eventually you have a cup of coffee with that person or whatever, and, and you get a chance to share, and, and they're drawn to you, and they, they, they see something in you, you get a chance finally to tell them about Jesus, and maybe you don't even know, but three years later they meet another person, and two years later they meet another person, and they come to Jesus, and they remember you. I knew this one girl that I work with you know, at, at, at Macy's or whatever, and there's something different about her, and then I met this guy. God wants to use all of you at the place where you work. It's part of your mission field. If you want to glorify God in your work, be diligent, develop a skill, go the extra mile, remember who you are working for, and last, and we'll wrap up, don't quit. Number five is don't quit. Once you've found your calling, stay focused on it. Finish what you've been given to do. Paul said in Acts 20, my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. I don't know about you, but that's my aim too. <laughs> I want to finish the race. I don't want to crash and burn and fall away from Jesus. I want to stay strong and walk with him. And I want to complete the task he's given me to do. He's given me a task. He's given you a task. And it's not one thing. You may have a career. If you've got kids, that's part of your task. And it may not be the same thing for your entire life. There'll be multiple things he sends you in, but finish them. Jesus himself said in John 17, 4, Father, he's praying to his Father, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. In order to finish, you're going to have to stay focused, especially if it's hard right now. Jesus had to Sweat drops of blood in the garden just before he went to the cross. It was hard, but he finished the work. You'll have to stay focused, and you'll have to say no to a lot of stuff, even good things. But Jesus said, I've finished the work. How do you know when your work is done? If you're older here, you know, hey, is it time for me to just, I did my part, you know. How do you know when your work is done? Here's my answer to that. If you're not dead, you're not done. <laughs> The American idea of retirement is not in the Bible. In the Bible, people worked hard and then they died. <laughs> Be encouraged with that. <laughs> but you do get a Sabbath every seven days. Um, they worked hard and then they died. Today, people think, oh, I want to work hard so I can chill out and just, you know, all I want to do with the rest of my life is just hang out and play golf or whatever. And if you know anybody who was able to retire young, most of the ones I meet, after a while, they worked hard, and, and they rest for a while, and then they want to do something. So what do you do after you've eaten every great meal you can eat, and you've got your condo in Hawaii, and you, whatever, you know? It's like, is this all I'm going to do for the rest of my life, is just chill out and sunbathe? No, I, I want to do something. You know why? Because you were created to do something. And if you're not dead, you're not done. And if you're older, one of the things you can do is continue to serve your kids, and once they have kids pour into your grandkids. Diana and I have some friends, a married couple, they just turned 70. They have four kids and spouses and 14 grandkids. They're not wealthy, so they're still working part-time. You know why? Because all the money they make, they're using to go, their kids are spread all over the country, so they can stay involved and fly to the different cities at key times and pour into their 14 grandkids. That's what they're doing. And they're doing some other stuff too. That's a great example to me. Some of you knew Tom Moore. Tom Moore, he served Jesus till he was 91, right? Literally up until he, he died. He and Isabel, both of them. They were here. They were, they were meeting people here. Lead, they used to go to this Murray Hill Cafe all the time and lead the servers to Christ. 
12 hours before Tom died, Dave Hughes ran into him at the hospital. He wasn't feeling well. He died 12 hours later that night. It was a New Year's Day. And he turns around. He goes, hey, it was Dave and another guy. God bless you guys. It was 12 hours before he died. He was just living to serve others and walk with Jesus. If you're older, you can pour into your kids that way. In fact, Proverbs 13 says a good person leaves an inheritance to their children's children. That's not talking about just money, although they'll gladly take your money. <laughs> it's, it's more than that. It's passing on a spiritual heritage. Well, hey, a while back, Dave told me when he brought my newspaper out, it's hard to find good people. But you know, in the kingdom of God, that shouldn't be the case. Would you agree? I hope word gets out that employers around uh, Portland say, hey, if you want to find good people, go to that solid rock church because they're all over the place there. We ought to be the best employees, and if you're an employer, the best employers in the city. You ought to be working so hard, and me too, that making such a good impression that your boss will say to you, hey, do you have any friends who work like you do? Because this is what I need around here. If you want to glorify God in your work this week, if you want to be one of the good people that are hard to find, be diligent. Whatever your job is right now, don't hardly work, work hard. If you develop a skill, you will stand before kings. God will bless you. Go the extra mile this week. Have the heart of a servant. Ask Jesus to give that to you. Remember who you're working for. You don't just work for Intel or Nike or whatever. You work for Jesus himself. And don't quit. If you're in a hard time right now, persist. Do a good job, and one day you will hear Jesus say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Here's your reward. Enter into the joy of your master. Phil, are you really saying that Jesus might actually say to me, well done for being an accountant? Well done for being a bank manager, an electrician, a mom? Yes, if you do your work to the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.